Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Stefan Schutz, and today I'm going in about an hour to attempt to point out a few of the reasons why I think sound matters. Um, for me personally, it matters a lot. It's what I've chosen to do for uh, pretty much since before I left school. My career has gone in so many different directions that uh, it has never been boring. And one of the things that I've spent an awful lot of my time doing is trying to get other people to understand the importance of sound, sound design, sound effects, music, dialogue, and all things audio-based um, to do within various different types of media. Um, I am fortunate in that what I do means that I absolutely love my job or my chosen career, and I guess maybe I'm very, very lucky in that. Um, and I have a fairly diverse history, as I mentioned, which I'm not going to go into. Um, one of the things I will point out, which actually isn't part of this presentation before I actually get into it, is that the, the URL that was av visible at the beginning of the screen and which will be available at the end of the screen is not only my own personal website, but it is also um, a resource for audio, which I would actually encourage all of you to have a bit of a look at because the core part of that is a sound effects library that I have spent over five years creating. It is online. Um, as well as other formats. It is, it is for sale commercially, but more importantly to Australians, it is online, it is covered, licensed under Creative Commons, which means it's free for educational uses for your students, for amateurs, etc. Um, currently it has over 18,000 sound effects. It will be hitting 20,000 sound effects before the end of the year. It is also, the entire collection is also going to be made part of the Australian National Film and Sound Archives. There are a whole bunch of other resources on that website. I will leave it at that. You can have a look at that or not at your own leisure. All right, sound more than um, vision or touch or smell, I guess, is probably one of the senses that we use more critically, and in fact, we don't even know we're using it half the time. If any of you have a phone in, on you at the moment that goes off, you will respond to it before you've even acknowledged necessarily what you're responding to. Uh, and in fact, that's, that's really one of the main points of the way sound works. Um, the whole point is, is that you're supposed to respond to it before you have time to think about it, because if you respond to it and jump out of the way of something, you've got a better chance of survival. Um, and, and this goes through, through a lot of species. I, I would not say every species on the planet, because I'm not um, that knowledgeable in biology, but for an awful lot of species, they basically survive due to sound. Um, humans, I think we've become a little bit less attuned to that because of our sort of safe lives, etc. But there are now certain sounds that we are still key to. And some of those, an alarm, whether it be a smoke detector or a fire alarm, a car horn. If you're walking across the road, not paying attention, you hear, hear a car horn, you will react. Quite often it'll be just in surprise, but you'll probably also react by sort of jumping out of the way again before you've even thought about it. Uh, I would also argue that if you're walking across the road and you heard quite literally, and I'm not talking about a simulated one, I'm talking about quite literally the sound of a big predatorial cat behind you, you would react. And in fact, if it was a tiger, you would probably, be, you would probably react by freezing on your spot because there are actually sub-frequencies within a tiger's growl that does quite literally freeze their prey for a nanosecond. So for, from, from that point of view, there are all sorts of interesting things within sound that, um, again, I won't go into in great detail, but there have been various different um, uses of sound within um, nature as well as man-made. So we use, this is one of the main, uh, in, my, in my opinion, there are two main areas that we use sound for. One of them is something that we, we think less about. I mean, we do use it. We use it, in, uh, as I said, the car horn, the fire alarm. But we use that because it's, it's an instinctual thing within a lot of creatures to just respond to certain types of sound. And you can obviously train people to react to a fire alarm, a mobile phone ringtone, etc. On the other level is something that, is something, something that I think is one of the things that does differentiate humans from, I would say, all other species. But this, again, has not necessarily been proven. And to me, it's one of the things, the intrinsically, that makes us human beings. Our ability and our desire to tell stories. For 
I, I think it's one of these things that people have always been looking at, you know, the, where humans became humans from, from, from monkeys to humans and, you know, things like discovery of, of, of cave paintings. I would argue that uh, people have been telling stories long before we even got to the point of cave paintings. Whether it was sort of Og, Grunt, Grog, um, sort of saying, hey, you know, I got chased up a tree by a tiger, but I live to tell about it. I really think this is one of the core things that makes us what we are as a species. We've got uh, thousands and thousands of years of uh, spoken dialogue, narrative, storytelling, passing on history. Um, and, and humans being humans, we embellish. So that's where myths and legends come from. It's like, oh, yeah, it wasn't a tiger, it was a dragon. Um, but telling stories is inherent to who and what we are in so many ways. And here's where I probably should, I guess, edit that somewhat. I say in all forms of media, sound has an overall purpose. I, I guess you could argue that if you're reading a book, sound is not that important. However, there are other people who might argue that, that they are. The environment in which you're reading the book can very, very much influence the experience of reading that book. If I gave you a, a, a book that was uh, sort of full of evocative uh, narrative situations, and I plunked you down in the middle of Times Square in New York City with lots of traffic and said, read the book, I would argue that your experience of that story and of the narrative that you're experiencing would be far different than if I took you out into a lovely scenic pasture somewhere with birds and insects and nice warm sun and said, here, read the book again. So this is, again, maybe on a subconscious level, but I would say that the sound is still influencing your experience there. A lot of people sit on the train reading a book but they might have their MP3 player going so that they're listening to music. Sound supports narrative. This is what my job is. This is what I've considered my job is. Actually, uh, this is what my job has been before I realised that this is what my job is about. Um, it's, a, it's a consideration that I've developed over years of realising, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, initially it's like, oh, I make some nice sound effects and things go boom, or I write some nice music and I'm, I'm happy with the music. Uh, and slowly I realised, this is what my job is, supporting the narrative. And, and this is what the job of music, audio, dialogue should be, supporting the narrative. Not intercepting the narrative, not stealing away from the narrative. And this is where, again, I think, what, this is one of the reasons why I think that audio, and using that term as the broader family of sound effects, music and dialogue, audio has an essential part to play in supporting narrative.